It's helped me welcome to the front Mr. Peter Moos to come and make the last presentation and then we break for tea. Thank you. Let's put our hands together and welcome again. Honourable Ministers, Ambassadors, Dignitaries, Madam Kimberly Process Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Peter Mayer, Chairman of the Dubai Diamond Exchange and Special Advisor Diamonds for the DMCC, a Dubai government entity. I have had the enormous pleasure and honor to assist the Ministry of Mines to organize this first Zimbabwe Diamond Conference 2012. We started less than three months ago, and I want to thank and congratulate the Minister, the Permanent Secretary and his team for the amazing work which was achieved, done and accomplished. In the last 10 years I've organized three conferences in Antwerp, three in Dubai, but this one here in Victoria Falls has far exceeded all expectations. Congratulations, Minister. And thanks for the Ladies and gentlemen, this is a slide of 1991, Dubai in 1991. I was then one year active in the diamond world. In my hometown in Antwerp, Belgium, the historical capital of the diamond world, it were different times then, 21 years ago. On this slide you can see how Dubai's current city center near Emirates Towers looked like. It was desert. It was before the development of any diamond business and of course before the existence of the Dubai Diamond Exchange, the DMCC, the Dubai Gold and Commodities Exchange. It was before the construction of the Palm Islands or the Burj Khalifa, which is now the largest building in the world. It was before the enlargement of Dubai to become the true cosmopolitan <coughs> and the logistical hub it is today. I started my career as a broker for the DTC, the marketing arm of the Bears in London, but I was based in my hometown Antwerp. Again, it were different times then. The Bears were still controlling 70% of the world production and selling all its diamonds from the UK capital. It was also still controlling all the Russian goods from Alrosa, which were distributed through the DTC channels. And it had buying offices in many African countries. It was a time, and we forget that because time goes so fast, that India was still a heavy, heavily controlled country, which allowed imports of diamonds only through a rigid licensing system based on the rupee, which actually nobody really understood except the Indians themselves, but which, according to my Indian friends, and I have it from the horse's mouth, allowed them to make nice money, despite this rigidity. It was a time that Beijing, the capital of the People's Republic of China, was still the city of bicycles. A time when the markets were still closed, just 21 years ago. When everybody spoke about the Chinese tiger waking up, but where the only image we had from China in the West were the Chinese restaurants on the corner of our Antwerp streets. Antwerp was then the secondary market for DTC goods. It was the natural destination of rough diamonds distributing close to 80% of the world production. Antwerp was also the mother, the grandmother, and the grandfather at the same time of this business. It was there where diamond polishing was invented in 1477, where the first diamond bourses were established, where rules and regulations to which Mr. Blom has referred to were made and which were later copied by so many new upcoming centers. What Antwerp had to offer to the market was actually quite simple. Security, a safe environment, a stable political climate, a hard working cutting industry, and let's be frank, a policy of laissez-faire, laissez-passer towards business, in particular the diamond business, 
and a welcome home for people from very different ethnical, cultural background and religion. I remember this as a child when I drove with my father through the Diamond District, which then was still accessible by a car. We were proud to have so many foreign people in our city. And Diamonds lifted the city from a provincial town of only 200,000 inhabitants to a world capital, a small one. But I'm not here to speak about my hometown, Antwerp. And those were for sure different times with different people with different attitudes. And clearly attitude towards foreign people has changed. In these days, the idea grew with the leadership of Dubai, one of the seven emirates of the UAE, to position itself as a logistical, commercial, and tourist hub for trade between the West and the East. Dubai, unlike the other emirates and the neighboring countries, had little oil. And the rulers of Dubai knew that they had to do better than their peers to create wealth for their people. One of these tools was established in the early years of 2002. It was the DMCC, then the Dubai Metals and Commodities Center. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just only 10 years ago. The rulers and their peers, amongst which Ahmed bin Sulaim, then still in his early 20s, knew that the location of Dubai made it a strategic hub between East and West, a place with excellent port facilities and accessibility, centrally located between producing and consuming countries for most commodities. And clever as they were, they knew that the ease of doing business and a fiscal friendly environment could attract companies to establish themselves in Dubai. But of course, they needed an infrastructure to put all these initiatives inside. So the plan to develop, to build one tower to host these commodities amongst which diamonds. The place was named Almas Tower, which you see here on the slide. Almas Tower today, the home of more than 600 diamond licensed companies and 400 more gold related entities. Almas Tower today, the tallest business building in the Middle East and the focal point of an area called JLT, Jumeirah Lake Towers. I arrived in Dubai in 2006, which is now almost seven years ago. Attracted by the ambition of these young guys and to be open and frank, a little bit uh, turned off by a less business friendly mentality in Europe and also in Belgium, I wanted to be part of this story of a new world capital in the make. And when I arrived in Dubai, Ahmed drove me around in JLT, which was still a piece of desert. And from his Range Rover, he pointed me to something which very much resembled a, a mini Kimberley mine. It was a big hole in the ground, which is now the Almas Tower. Today, seven years later, Jumeirah Lake Towers is the home of 50,000 people who live and work in about 62 high towers, hosting almost more than 5,200 companies. Today, the DMCC, which Mr. Bin Sulaim chairs, welcomes more than four new companies per day. Yes, you heard it right, per day. The rise of Dubai has, ladies and gentlemen, indeed been astronomical, especially after the crisis. And I must admit that when the crisis hit us, barely two years after I arrived there, we were all shaken. And of course, the whole world order had been taken apart, and it becomes more and more clear that we are still in the repairing phase. My friends sent me to come back home. Dubai was over and out. Media all over the world spoke about it. I had not come to the city of gold, which historically was Dubai's trade name, but to the city of gamblers. The fairy tale ended in a nightmare. 
But that was a little bit too much wishful thinking from their part. I stayed, and so did Dubai. As a phoenix out of the ash, Dubai rose again, and in no time. And this because the rulers decided to stand upright for their principles, which were low and very affordable real estate prices, security, safety, an excellent infrastructure of air and seaports, high labor ethics, hospitality and an open and welcoming attitude for foreigners, labor for affordable prices, a fiscal environment of no tax and ease of doing business. All this brought back business in no time. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time that the West is still putting plasters on a broken leg, Dubai has become the destination of choice between East and West and is starting to grow to its full potential. Also in the diamond trade, since 2003, when the DDE was established, Dubai has risen from anonymity to becoming one of the leading trading hubs in the diamond world. In 2011, the total value of diamonds traded through Dubai rose to a record 39 billion, making it one of the top global trade centers by value and volumes. Within the UAE, diamond trade is a major economic contributor and has become the second largest non-oil contributor to the UAE's economy. Since 2008, the year of the crisis, Dubai's diamond trade has almost tripled. And since this is a pan-African diamond gathering, I want to go through just through a few import figures with you because imports are a good reflector of what is going on. Just two examples from after the crisis, which are a witness of the growth of our business with Africa. This slide on South Africa shows the trend of rock diamonds coming from South Africa. South Africa's imports, uh, our imports from South Africa grew from 57 million in 2009 to 152 million in 2011, an increase of almost 270%. And then, of course, Zimbabwe. It's uh, almost difficult to speak here about a growth in percentage because the growth is 22,972%. Uh, growing from $1.8 million to more than $400 million in 2011. And of course, we have our traditional ties with countries like Angola and DRC. Angola more than 500 million, DRC close to 100 million. And at the same time, also other changes have taken place. Changes which are becoming what I think, what we think are structural, st structural changes, affecting the old picture of the diamond business I entered in 1990. From Europe, the site holders of the DTC started sending their goods directly to Dubai distributing further to the cutting centers in the Far East and India. Followed by Russia, where site holders of Al Rosa started shipping more than $100 million of rough goods directly to Dubai. And sometimes it's even enough that one individual trader moves to a place to suddenly see a rise in imports of sometimes almost 100 million, see Lebanon. Ladies and gentlemen, it's maybe the time now to say a few words on the Kimberley process before I close with my a few nice words on Dubai. I think that we have reached a point in time that we should reflect a little bit on what the KP has achieved in just 10 years. And what is often forgotten and strikes me it is that we forget to stress the uniqueness of the KP compared to other commodities. No other commodity in the world, not gold, not tin, not platinum, not tantalum, not whatever, has even been close to what has been established in Interlaken in 2002 in Switzerland. The KPC is as is the only international scheme which, ha which has had an impact 
on the national legislation of 76 governments which have changed their national laws and which is based on rules which can be invoked before courts of these participating countries. These 76 governments have legislation which goes far beyond the voluntary principles of the OECD or other organizations which are trying to ensure compliance of other commodities like gold, like tantalum, like tin. And as such, the KP should be considered a model for the future and an accomplishment to be proud of and which should be promoted as such internationally by all KP participants and observers. Compared to other commodities, diamonds are about to reach the finish of a marathon. A marathon and the finish is 100% conflict free, where so many other commodities have not even started to run the marathon. To spin the positive impact of the KPCS in the international public forum is long overdue. And it should become one of the first priorities in the immediate future. We have made a resolution in that regard, which is on your seat, and which we hope will be adopted unanimously at the next KP plenary in Washington, D.C., in less than two weeks from now. I'm going to read it. It's very short. Resolution to the KP plenary in Washington, D.C. on November 27th. Participants and observers should promote a positive image of what the KPCS has accomplished in the international trade in rough, rough diamonds as being the first commodity having reached a status of 99.9% conflict-free trade. Can we agree on that? For Dubai, we cannot but feel rather confident about the future. Little by little, it becomes clear that there is a new silk route coming up for trade between African producing countries and the rest of the world, from Africa over Dubai to India and the Far East. The move of the DTC offices, Jacob to Botswana, in about eight months will probably reinforce this structural change. Based on the core principles of good, excellent logistics, security, hospitality, ease of doing business, no tax, high work ethics, and last but not least, location, location, and location, the new Silk Route is about to become a reality. We are doing a conference on the subject on 18 and 19 March of next year. We would like to invite you all to join us. We hope to have many delegates from the African producing countries and of course, Minister from Zimbabwe in particular. It is indeed high time to unlock Zimbabwe's diamond potential together. You can count on us for that. As in the past, we will support all initiatives that give better value to your country's minerals. To the greater good of the people of Zimbabwe, Dubai and the Dubai Diamond Exchange will work together with you to add value to the wealth of your nation. I thank you.